slavery in America was by far the darkest time period in early American history. People were forced from their homelands into ships and being sent out to America, being sold and separated from their families to work in plantations and to be treated harshly. It is said that slavery started in America in 1619, and the beginning of the end of slavery took place after the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, which took effect on January 1st, 1863. However, this only freed the slaves that were part of the Confederacy, and not the states that still had slavery that were loyal to the Union. It took an amendment to the Constitution known as the 13th Amendment, which was ratified on December 6, 1865, which abolished all slavery throughout the United States. This took place eight months after the Civil War ended. As I mentioned earlier, the Emancipation Proclamation took effect on January 1, 1863, which freed all the slaves that were part of the Confederate States. However, Texas and slave owners kept that news to themselves for two and a half years, while their slaves were busy working, not knowing that they were free. So, on June 19, 1865, Union Major General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston, Texas with 2,000 troops and a message saying that all slaves were free in the state of Texas. This historical event is known as Juneteenth. On July 9, 1868, the 14th Amendment was ratified, giving citizenship to African Americans that were born into slavery. And on February 3, 1870, the 15th Amendment was ratified, giving African-American men the right to vote. Although this seems like a very positive thing, there were still many hardships for African-Americans in America for many years to come. In today's video, we're going to be focusing on Texas in the 1870s, specifically San Antonio, Texas. We're going to be talking about three families that lived in San Antonio, the Griffin family, the Hockley family, and the Winters family. Now, the significance of these families is that they were once slaves, and they owned land on the northeast side of San Antonio. What's really interesting about these families is that they had a little community on their piece of land that consisted of a school, a church, and a cemetery for African-American people that lived around the area during that time. I'll be giving a video tour of these family and community cemeteries, as well as a bit of a backstory behind these families and the story on how these cemeteries were rediscovered by the help of Everett Fly, who is an architect, landscape architect, and historic preservationist, as well as the help of conservation groups, volunteers, and the descendants of these families. Our first stop is going to be the Griffin Family Cemetery, which is located in the Oak Ridge Village subdivision on the intersection of Thousand Oaks and Tavern Oaks. The following clip is going to consist of Everett Fly giving the history of the land on the northeast side of San Antonio and the history on the Griffin family. 281 runs along a, a boundary of a Spanish land grant subdivision. Um, and so I use those old Spanish land grant maps to help me find my way and uh, find reference points. Uh, after the Spanish colonial period, when it became the Republic of Texas, the government of Texas used land to pay veterans that fought in the, uh, the Mexican War. And one of the land grants was to a gentleman named Coker, John Coker. And I began to research Coker and discovered that he owned slaves. And uh, Coker's land grant uh, it was several thousand acres because of his service in the, uh, the Republic of Texas War. So Coker's land grant, one of the lines ran kind of parallel to this route that we're going on 281, and then it went to the right, which is east. Coker had so much land that uh, he had come from Alabama, but he had so much land that he sent for his brothers and there are um, accounts and records, um, again, in the Texas General Land Office where he invites his brothers to come to Texas to help him work the land, and he tells them, bring your slaves. And so then once Coker and his brothers get here with the slaves, they began to parcel out the land for themselves, and then they even began to sell to other 
people that are interested in, in farming or owning land. And eventually, again, in the land records, we see sales from some of the Coker descendants to some of the black descendants of the Griffins and the Winters and the Jacksons. And so, again, that's how we piece the story together. So all of this land, as we're driving uh, on Thousand Oaks, this would have been Coker's land grant on, you know, the north to the left and the south to the right. And, of course, this uh, Thousand Oaks, uh, basically, when Melanie's, the Griffins, uh, her descendants, the Griffins, owned their property out here, this was just a wagon road. Right. You know, like a one-lane rack wagon road, and you could, you know, barely have enough space to get over and let the other wagon go by. So Horace Griffin was Melanie's descendant, and Horace was brought to Texas from Florida about 1850. His land started here, where this, uh, on the right, where this uh, kind of uh, creek or wash, as we call it, is, and went north all the way up to the, the, the hill at the horizon up there. And we, to this point, we don't know how Horace and then his son Ellis accumulated the money to, to buy 300 uh, acres, but they did. We we've, we've found the deeds where they bought it by legal purchase. We know that Horace was, a, a, today you might say he was a wagon master or a teamster. In other words, he drove freight wagons, you know, pulled by horses or mules, and would carry uh, different goods and materials between here, San Antonio, and uh, west. There's a small community called Uvalde, U-V-A-L-D-E. Um, it's about 40, 45 miles. And if you can imagine <laughs> driving a wagon <laughs> two ways, you know, 45 miles back and forth. But that's what he did for a living. And then once they accumulated this land, they grew cotton and corn and um, uh, other produce. And then they had cattle. We are now at the Oak Ridge Village subdivision walking up to the Griffin Family Cemetery. When walking up the road from the entrance of the subdivision, to your right there is a community park. Now, it doesn't look out of the ordinary, except for this gated area here, and this is the Griffin Family Cemetery. This 300 acres of land was once owned by the Griffin family, until it was sold to the Pape family in 1941. The Griffins kept the cemetery though for themselves and is still owned by the descendants of the Griffins to this day. This neighborhood was developed sometime in the 1990s and the developers were responsible enough to build around it and not disturb this cemetery. Throughout the years, the homeowner association and volunteers have kept up with this cemetery. When you walk in, you see these two metal posts here, as well as a bunch of other metal posts along the perimeter of the cemetery, marking out the original fence line. 
Now the marker that you see here, I believe is a footstone for Ellis Griffin's grave and not an actual grave site. These little stones here, I believe, are once again footstones for the grave of George Ann and Salbit Griffin, which we saw previously. Although the plaque on the front of the cemetery says that the first burial took place in 1900, it looks like there might have been other burials that took place before then on this site. Now on to the Hockley Clay Cemetery. The Hockley Clay Cemetery is located on the intersection of Higgins and Ur Lane, right behind Northern Hills Elementary School. Unlike the Griffin Family Cemetery, the Hockley Clay Cemetery was forgotten once a neighborhood was built around it in the 1980s. It took a curious resident of the Northern Hills subdivision to rediscover this old cemetery. Matthew and Rachel and I would look, walk by and we'd see this overgrown lot and go, what the freeholders is this? Finding the answer became a mission for this retired Air Force major, searching archives and finding old records. But why? History? And uh, it's a mystery and a history. A mystery that began unraveling with the help of a landscape architect nationally recognized for his work on historic sites. Former slaves were up here and this is uh, their, their land. What's here, they say, is a remarkable find. A cemetery established over a century ago by one of them, Jane Warren, who owned over 100 acres. No one has been able to tell us that a historic African-American site like this has ever been recovered. We are now being able to do something that has never been done in San Antonio before. It's to uncover a hidden cemetery. So they've organized a big cleanup all day Saturday that they want to finish in one day with the help of equipment on loan and willing volunteers in shifts to carry and move debris. In the Northern Hills subdivision between these two homes is a pathway that leads you to Northern Hills Elementary. Walking into this gate into the back part of the Northern Hills Elementary School, and to your right, is the Hockley Clay Cemetery. As you could see, thanks to volunteers, the cemetery has been cleared of brush and shrubbery. Looking through the gate, I saw these two stones that look like remnants of old tombstones. Other than that, there are no resemblance of a grave marker on this 1.26 acres of land. This whole area was once owned by a freed slave. Her name was Jane Warren. Jane Warren was born in Alabama in 1830, and in 1847 she was relocated to Hayes County, which is in Texas. Now between there and 1871, she relocated to San Antonio. In 1871, she purchased 107 acres of land, and in 1908, she dedicated 1.26 acres of land for a cemetery which is the land that you see here. Jane was married to a man by the name of William Hockley. However, she didn't take his last name. Together, they had many kids. As you can see in front of you, this is what I believe is the remnants of the original fence to the cemetery. After the cleanup project was done in October of 2018, an archeological project took place at this cemetery. Their mission was to find old artifacts of this old cemetery. The report done by UTSA's Center for Archaeological Records really did a good job in explaining the history of this land once owned by Jane Warren and her family, and the history and their findings at this old Hockley Clay Cemetery. As you see in this photo, there are orange flags marking possible artifacts of the cemetery's past. Upon further research, these were the items that were tagged by those orange flags. The only artifact pieces they found that looked like it belonged to a grave was this temporary grave marker and pieces of metal welded together to look like a cross. Although there are no names on these crosses or any grave markers, death certificates had to be pulled up from the descendants of the Hockleys and the Clays, and this is what came up. It is assumed that they are buried at the Hockley Cemetery. Also, it is assumed that more people are buried at this cemetery 
and not only descendants of the Hockleys or the Clays, but people who lived around that area at the time. Here is a map from 1929 that shows the parcels of land and who owned it. And the red rectangular area is where the Hockley Clay Cemetery is. What's really interesting is that there are aerial views that are provided in this report that date back from 1929. Inside the red area is the Hockley Clay Cemetery, and you can see its progression throughout the years. Sometime in the 1970s, a descendant of the Hockleys, Esther Jane Hockley Clay, sold off the property to developers. The last known burial at the cemetery was in 1971. After a survey was done sometime in 2019 or 2020, they found out that two homeowners' backyards actually encroached the old Hockley Clay Cemetery. When the homeowners purchased their home, they weren't aware that a part of their backyard was a part of an old cemetery. After some time, they finally decided to give a part of their backyard back to the Hockley Clay Cemetery. By doing this, the Hockley Clay Cemetery regained its 6,000 square feet of land. On Ur Lane behind Northern Hills Elementary is this little service alley that takes you to another entrance towards the Hockley Clay Cemetery. Now I strongly advise that you take heed of these signs that says no trespassing, but I felt like I could stick my hand through there and get a better view of this cemetery. What's really interesting about the woman who purchased this land, Jane Warren, was that she was the first African-American woman to own cattle in Texas. She even had her own cattle brand, which is the brand that you see right here. After Jane Warren passed away on November 7th, 1913, her children took over the property. It was passed down to other descendants, and as I mentioned earlier, the last person to own these acres of land was Esther Jane Hockley Clay, who sold the property sometime in the 1970s. However, this cemetery is still owned by the Hockley Clay family. Even though we may never know the exact number of people buried at this cemetery, or where each grave is located, it is really amazing that this cemetery was rediscovered many years later. Without this discovery, we may have never known about the history of the northeast side of San Antonio, and about how freed African American slaves owned land in this area. While editing this video, I found out that on February 16, 2022, the Hockley Clay Cemetery was designated as a Cultural Heritage District, meaning that it is historically recognized. This is very important because it protects the history of African Americans who called San Antonio home years after they were freed from slavery. Our last stop will be on the intersection of 1604 and Nacogdoches Road. This cemetery is known as the Winners Jackson Cemetery. While others see this as undeveloped land, records show that this land was once owned by a freed slave by the name of Robert Winters. Now inside this parcel of land are the remnants of the Winters Jackson Cemetery. Now the reason why I say remnants is because of this story here. This was all ours. All of this was ours. And that's where our family was buried at one time. Until 1986, a national expert on African-American landmarks discovered their graves had been disinterred. But no disinterment permit. In other words, nothing that permitted their remains to be moved. Apparently without notifying the families. It's still bugging me to this day because somebody got away with something. They weren't moved uh, really to protect them. It was just to get them out of the way. The irony, now prime real estate, the land was never developed. Inside this wooded, vacant lot is where the original cemetery was located. Fly's most troubling discovery, the remains were buried in a mass grave in a Catholic cemetery about a mile away. It's an affront to the family. Uh, it's an issue of uh, social justice. Some things just never change, and this is an example of that. This was her first time seeing it for herself. Here's the marker right here. Oh, wow. Among those buried here... A so buffalo soldier. To be in a mass grave. To be in a mass grave. Mm -hmm. His name was Amos Jackson. No regard. 
After hearing that news clip, it is very troubling to hear that the remains from the Winters Jackson Cemetery were moved without family permission, without legal permit, into a mass grave at the Holy Cross Cemetery down the road, which we'll visit in just a moment. In 2018, UTSA's Center for Archaeological Records did an archaeological study on the Winters Jackson Cemetery site and provided this report here. When you walk up to the Winters Jackson Cemetery, this is the view that you see. The cemetery is in the middle of the field that I showed you earlier, and the new owners of this land is Faskin Oil and Ranch Limited, so this is private property. However, they were cooperative to give UTSA's archaeological department access to do their research. While walking through the Winters Jackson Cemetery, these old fence posts, as well as old fencing, were found, giving them the idea of the boundary of this cemetery. It is safe to assume that this cemetery was established in the 1870s. After the graves were disturbed and the bodies were removed in 1986, eight piles of back dirt was left behind on this cemetery. After a screening process, they found the following artifacts that were left behind in these back piles of dirt. Most of these artifacts consisted of hardware that came from coffins and buttons that might have fallen off from the deceased. Now what's really disturbing is that they found three pieces of human remains, which was a fragment of a rib, an upper portion of the sternum, and a toe. In total, there were 72 bodies that were relocated to the Holy Cross Cemetery. However, descendants of the Winters family recollect there being over a hundred graves at the Winters Jackson Cemetery. In this report, it states that the cemetery is designated as a historic Texas cemetery, and that they recommend a buffer zone be made around this cemetery so that any future development doesn't encroach or disturb the cemetery. As I mentioned earlier, this land was once owned by a man named Robert Winters. This right here is the letter given to him by his former owner, E.C. Ellsbury. Ellsbury thanked him for his faithful service and offered Winters two horses. Ellsbury also helped Robert Winters purchase the over 100 acres of land. Like Jane Warren, Robert Winters owned cattle. This is his cattle brand that you see right here. Robert Winters also put away land to make a small community that consisted of a school and a church. The church once stood where this Jim's restaurant is today on 1604 Nacogdoches. We'll now make our way down to Nacogdoches Road to the Holy Cross Cemetery to visit the remains that were once laid at the Winters Jackson Cemetery. When driving through the entrance, you make a left and you walk into this area here. When you see this tree here, the mass grave is right behind this tree up against the fence here. And here is the mass grave of the people who were buried at the Winters Jackson Cemetery. In these graves are the unknown remains of 66 individuals and of Amos Jackson who was a Buffalo soldier, Duckles Franklin, Lizzie Conley, Antonio Anthony, James Mears, Rini Mears. These remains were transferred from a private cemetery located at the northeast corner of the junction of Nacogdoches Road and the Charles West Anderson Loop. August 1986. And the souls of the just are in the hand of God. Wisdom 3.1 Not only is it gut-wrenching that all these people were buried in one mass grave, but also their original grave markers were discarded and buried along with them. This is an example why history like this should never be forgotten and should not be discarded. It is up to the curious, like Michael Wright, to ask questions and to research on these forgotten places. It is up to preservationists like Everett Fly to make sure that these historical places are protected and cared for. And it is up to the descendants of the Griffins, the Hockleys, the Clays, the Winners, and the Jacksons to share their stories about their families 
so that we could learn about their rich history. That concludes our tour of these three African-American cemeteries in the northeast side of San Antonio. If you're part of the family that was mentioned in this video, please share your stories in the comment section below. And as always, if you like what you saw today, be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Again, I thank you for watching, and I thank you for being a part of this channel.